Dr. Neil Shaw has spent the past decade at Harvard Medical School serving as an obstetrician gynecologist. His work focuses on improving health care and addressing disparities in care. From the John Oliver Show and PBS to Oprah Winfrey's new Smithsonian Channel documentary, The Color of Care, Dr. Shaw is on a mission to expose and address America's racial inequities in health care. I sit down with him. Coming up next. Live from Los Angeles, this is the special report with Ariva Martin. Good morning and welcome, Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. First of all, just congratulations on the great work that you been doing with the documentary we were going to talk about the co-op care but also uh, aftershock the other documentary that you are intimately involved in uh how does it feel to have your work your work around healthcare disparities be literally displayed to an international audience uh, i it's a mix of things you know obviously it's a little nerve-wracking uh to be on screens but uh it's also really validating uh like you said this has been uh, a decade of effort and um you know, this is an issue, uh, racial inequality, inequality in healthcare and maternal mortality specifically has been an academic discussion. And now it's being platformed by the White House and Oprah Winfrey. So of course that's great. Yeah, we're gonna talk about uh, both of the documentaries. I'll start with the color of care. Just what was it like working with Oprah on a project, like you said, that traditionally has been talked about in medical schools and law schools and other graduate schools, but now, Someone like her with such a huge platform has taken an interest in this topic. What was it like working with her? Yeah, I mean, to be totally honest with you, I didn't know Oprah was involved until uh, after I sat down for the interview. The, the person who reached out was Yance Ford, who was the director. And Yance is a, um, a trans man who uh, was nominated for an Academy Award for his film Stronger Island about uh, his brother who was murdered by police for which there was no justice so he he is a serious uh artist and uh, a serious person and he reached out to me um after there was a new york times article on what um black mothers in particular were facing in new york city at the height of the pandemic and there's an article that quoted me and also featured my friend bruce mcintyre who lost his partner amber isaac and um, I didn't think I was going to be in the film when I talked to Yance. I uh, actually both films. I expected to be in the background. You know, my job is um, usually just to try to be as helpful as I can as an academic. But you know, uh, if, if it's not apparent already, like the, this, the screen is not my comfort zone. Uh, so um, I was surprised when Yance asked me to be on camera, and even then I was hesitant because uh, you know I'm melanated, so I've got a little bit of perspective on uh, racism in America and more broadly, but. Uh, you know, I don't have the lived experience of being a black mom. And so uh, I wasn't sure I was the right person. Um, but Yance uh, ended up drawing a lot out of me and uh, ended up saying things on camera that I'd really never said publicly before. And it, uh, everyone will get to see it in a couple of weeks. So, yeah, we, we know that the color of care aired on the Smithsonian Channel. And I was struck by what Oprah Winfrey said she was struck by. She said she had read a report about the disparities related to COVID uh, during the height. And she said some of the, the stuff she read literally stopped her in her tracks. She talked about this man, Gary Fowler, who died in his home because no one would treat him despite his COVID-19 symptoms. So Oprah was struck by that. And I remember spending months at the beginning of the pandemic interviewing families myself who talked about sitting for hours in hospital waiting rooms and, and watching white families be taken back to you know beds and be examined by doctors, but black families having to sit for hours. How unique are the stories that were told in the color of care? Because on one hand, people may think these are you know just anomalies, but from my work and I'm sure from yours, there's a different story. No, absolutely. I think every person of color uh, is aware of the differences in which they're treated in everyday life, uh, and healthcare isn't immune from that by 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 any means. But I think um, you know, the thing about the pandemic that was really really remarkable is that um, it took it took people's like full context and their what was happening to them biologically, and it just collided everything in, in these really stark terms. Like I was uh, in Boston at the height of the pandemic, and the hardest hit 
city was the city of Chelsea on the outskirts of Boston. Um, and, you know, uh, people would call me on the phone while I was on call as an obstetrician with symptoms of COVID-19. And if they didn't meet the criteria on my sheet for coming into the hospital, I would tell them to just isolate at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was because we were trying to keep people out of the hospital. It was well intended. But the whole reason they were infected in the first place is because they couldn't self-isolate. They were living in multi-generational housing. They were driving buses. Um, and uh, that, that, things like that were happening all the time, right? And of course, they felt dismissed by me when I was like, stay home. And then they would come in, you know, and then uh, they wouldn't be able to bring their loved ones in with them. And it, it just created this whole uh, cycle where it was really challenging for them to advocate for themselves. Yeah, and you, you mentioned, Dr. Shaw, that you're melanated, but you obviously are not African-American. You're obviously not an African-American woman. But what do you think, it, you know, that, that what do you think about your training or what is it about your training and your experiences that allow you to speak to the issues that African-Americans and particularly African-American women uh, experience as it relates to access to health care and treatment by the health care system? I mean, I think honestly, we're all products of our environment. And so I think, um, I don't know. I mean, to be totally honest with you, I think um, I never thought it was gonna be an obstetrician. Um, you know, and then in medical school, you have to deliver babies. And like, unless you have no soul, you're like, well, that's cool. You know, I like wanna be around for things like this. But then really what it was, especially as a dude in my mid twenties was I like for the first time saw what people with a uterus go through. And I've been following that curiosity ever since. Uh, and then I became a public health professor, and uh, I did not understand how it's possible that a person today in the United States is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than her own mother, and three to four times more likely to die if she's black. I just wanted to understand what was going on. And uh, it's impossible to understand this without looking at it through the lens of racial equity and without questioning um, the ways in which we're trained and the environment that we're, that, like, you know, it's sort of like that fish and water thing. Like there's like the George Foster Wallace thing about like the fish who swims up to their fish and it's like, hey boys, how's the water? And the other one's like, what's water? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, um, that's, that's how we're trained. And it's interesting, doctor, and we've spent a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time talking to maternal health experts and, and black women who have made their lives work, working on these issues. What is so unique about black women in our healthcare system that black women, not Latinx women, not Asian women, not other minority women, but black women in particular have these outrageous maternal death rates. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you can't paint any group of people as a monolith, of course, but um, clearly anti-black racism is a very severe form of racism and it's rooted in a very specific history, especially in the United States. Uh, you know, the institution of medicine and uh, slavery grew up at the same time. Like you can't commoditize a human being uh, and assign a value to them and their reproductive potential without, uh, you know, um, seeing them as not, not, uh, not, not seeing their humanity, right? And so I think that there's a lot of things historically that have become entrenched in medicine um, that have just propagated into the future. Um, and there are many examples of that. The primary one is that uh, people with black skin were regarded as biologically different, even though we're all the same biologically, fun in the most fundamental and important ways. And one of the ways that that manifested itself in order to justify uh, slavery as an institution was this idea that black people experience pain differently. And nobody says that to you in a medical school lecture, but everything that you see reinforces this idea. Wow. Can, can, give us some examples of that. Like, yes, they're not stating that overtly as a professor standing in front of a lecture class, but you said everything that you see in medical school reinforces that. Give us some examples of how it's reinforced. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, so one thing is uh, just from a representation standpoint, most of what you see in textbooks, I guess less textbooks these days and on, more on screens, but, you know, it's, it's white skin. Um, and um, when you're a brand new doctor in a hospital, you're not actually expected to know very much. The only thing that you're expected to do is know the difference between someone who looks sick and someone who doesn't, right? And so if you're one of my interns on my surgery floor uh, and I'm in the operating room, I need you to come back and report back to me if you think one of my patients is bleeding. And how do you know that, right? Like you look at someone and you think they're pale, but if you're melanated, you're not going to look pale in the same way. 
Right. Uh, and so that might lead to a delay in care. Um, you know, I, I also think, you know, it's there's just this deep seated implicit bias, really, that uh, it, it's been shown repeatedly that when black people and black women in particular complain about symptoms that they're having and especially pain, the healthcare system like just is slower to respond. And that difference in time can make all the difference when it comes to life or death. Yeah, you mentioned those textbooks, which are now obviously online, but we actually did a show because there was this image of a black fetus yeah. that went viral. That went viral. Yeah, yeah. You probably saw that. And we actually did a whole show around it and had uh, folks who were actually illustrators of medical books talk about how few African American and even any minority uh, illustrators there are. And that because there's not representation, the notion of you know, drawing uh, fetuses and other a anatomical parts, you know, and make them reflect people of color was just something that never was done, just historically had not been the case. Yeah, it was never done. And I think, you know, the way that race as a construct operates is that it makes people who are not white seem like the other, right? I mean, I'm old enough to remember when you would pull out this Crayola crayons and there would be one that said skin and you'd be like, what? You know? Um, and, uh, you know, never question why Band-Aids are the color that they are, right? Uh, yeah. But um, when you see people as other, that starts to uh, allow for people to not question a bunch of things that are just, you know, uh, one, one example that we talk about in the film, actually both films, is that there are a bunch of calculators that we use that quanti quantitatively treat Black people differently that I used in my practice and never questioned. One in particular, if someone has had a C-section the first time, they don't necessarily need a C-section for their next baby. But a lot of people are nervous right. the second time around, and they want to know, like, what are my odds of having a success successful vaginal delivery? So you run them through a calculator where you put in their age, you put in their body mass index, and up until this year, you would put in their race. Mm. And if they were Black, it would drop their likelihood of having a successful vaginal delivery, like 10, 15 points, and you would subject them to potentially a needless surgery. And um, what about that, that algorithm of that equation caused that 10 to 15 point drop because someone was black? That's the question, right? So what we've done historically, and this is really the answer to all the questions, is we've conflated race and racism, right? In every single scientific study in public health, there's a table one where you break down the demographics of the population that you're studying and you talk about how many people were white, how many people were not white, usually. Um, and, uh, you know, we look at that row and we're like, ah, race is the variable. And we're not thinking that actually that's a proxy for racism mm -hmm. um, fundamentally. Like, so it is true. Like, you know, black women are less likely to successfully have a vaginal delivery. But it's not because of biology. It's because they're less likely to be su supported right. to have a vaginal delivery. And then it becomes this vicious cycle. So that race wasn't like code for underlying health conditions, diabetes, no. hypertension. It had nothing to do with any kind of biological issues going on within, in Black women. No, we, and we have calculators for all kinds of things that we have historically broken down by race. Like the way that your kidney filters toxins up until this year there's a different cutoff for normal for people who are black and people who are not. And that would uh, basically gatekeep medications from black people. And these are things like in 2022 are still dominant parts of the practice. They're not like, you know, uh, edge cases. That's how most people in America are practicing. So, so th this is what was taught or is taught in and, medical schools across the country, including yes, and it's what was schools, done. Harvard, and, Yale, Stanford. Yep, and it still is what is done in most cases. Wow. So right. if you're a doctor coming out of medical school and you learn, this is what you've been indoctrinated with for four years, and then you've gone on to a residency where a doctor that's in his 60s is teaching you or reinforcing that because that's what he was taught. And I'm saying he because most likely it's a he. Yeah. Right, he, right? How do you ever break out of that? How do you get to the point where you are when you recognize that race is a proxy for racism? Have you read the book, The Giver? 
there, there's there's an it's 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 a like this classic God. children's book but at the end basically like everybody sees in black I read like every children's book in the world because i have three kids so, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're probably all swimming in your head but there's a yeah. there's a point at the end of the book where like the main character uh has only seen the world in black and white and all of a sudden he sees color and like it's a similar thing where like you i, I just felt like um yeah I, you, you, I didn't question any of this and then what happened was i think we started to have uh, well, well, first of all, uh, I saw through the lens of maternal mortality because I think that the well-being of moms is sort of a bellwether for the well-being of society as a whole. And so every injustice in our society shows up in the well-being of moms, whether it's gender inequity or racial inequity, geographic inequity. And so that, that was the lens through which uh, I started my learning journey, I guess. And then as stories of Black moms dying got into the media, my patients started becoming my teachers oh. and um, they were telling me that, you know, um, and, and then they were like, there was one case, I'll be very honest about this, where I was uh, on the John Oliver show and I was talking about these issues. And then one of my patients came to me and they were like, uh, you know, Dr. Shah, I felt dismissed by you. Um, and that was, uh, you know. Uh, uh, what did you say that, that made her feel dismissed? I think, uh, you know, she, as I recall, she was, pregnant and pregnancy is uncomfortable and uh some of your job as an obstetrician is to normalize the discomforts of pregnancy but i think you know the the thing is that what i have learned in the last couple of years is that doctors are sort of trained to attend to safety first and treat people's experience as a secondary luxury that you get to after i've made you safe mm -hmm. and what i'm learning and what the story of black women in maternal health is showing is that we have that backwards. The way that you make people safe is actually by attending to their lived experience. Mm -hmm. So in that particular case, like I'm sure I could have done more to make sure that she felt affirmed by me and, and really heard by me. How was it for you to, you graduated from Harvard Medical School, right? No. Uh, I, went, I went to Harvard, I trained at Harvard, yeah. So here you are, top medical school in the country. I'm sure feeling pretty good that you have a great education. And now having to learn, as you just said, from your patients, that so much of what you were taught dismissed them, marginalized them, made them feel invisible. How, how did you respond to that initially? Because a lot of people could have been very defiant. They could have been defensive, right? Like, hey, I went to Harvard. You, you don't tell me, I, I tell you, which is the attitude that a lot of folks like you and me who went to Harvard have, unfortunately, we'll just own that. We know that our peers often have that kind of arrogance, but how is it that you were open to listening to what these women had to say? I mean, I, I guess I thought it was my job, <laughs> but, but, but also, you know, um, for the, a, a bad system will beat a good person every time. I think that's the thing. I mean, obviously, like when you're uh, understanding that you haven't been taking good care of people, uh, or as good care as you as you might want to, it's like gut wrenching. It's hard, right? Um, we all want to be good people, but also there is a very important interpersonal dimension to racism, and there is a really important moral dimension to racism. And also, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And so, I think part of what uh, has been helpful to me is looking at it through a systems lens. You know, it's really hard for people to engage in a dialogue when you're telling them that they're bad. Right, we're all taught that racism is evil, and uh, you know I think uh, if if we're able to look at it through a more systems and structural lens, you can be like, oh, there are algorithms we have to go back and revisit.